Now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up, MLC Chief Jeff Lloyd talks to us about his plans for NAB's big wealth management business this year ahead of its spin-off and why he sees opportunity in financial advice. Via Gogo pitches to stay in Australia despite the critics. Chief Business Reporter Leo Shanahan talks to Global Chief Executive Chris Miller. And former footy midfielder Andrew Thompson explains what he's doing to kick goals for his high net worth clients at Lucerne Investment Partners. We'll also get a Brexit update with David McCready, the head of the Australia British Chamber of Commerce. More movement there. Look, it's budget week, but I think much more impactful on the economy at the moment is the credit squeeze, as I've been saying all week, really. And while ASIC chief James Shipton insists that the responsible lending laws haven't changed, the new why not litigate stance of the watchdog and all round spotlight on lending has made banks very nervous. Lending is slower if it's happening at all. It's collateral damage uh, of the huge shift in culture being driven by Kenneth Hayne. There's another area where the pendulum may be swinging far too far, I think, and that is in financial advice. Clearly, there were some bad, bad things that happened, and banks are taking much longer than expected to remediate customers to the fury of ASIC. But banks are now exiting financial planning. NAB and Westpac, among them, are both on the record, I think, saying they can't make money out of the business, especially under the new regime. Instead, financial planning is much more in the hands of the new players. And, importantly, some new players without a lot of capital behind them, and many without indemnity insurance. Seven or eight years ago, the ratio of planners backed, backed in, uh, institutions like the Big Four and AMP to others was about 80 to 20. Now, as I understand, it's almost reversed 30 70. Well, why does it matter having capital backing as a financial planner? It's because if something does go wrong with these new financial planners with their shiny new license plates, customers may not be able to get their money back at all. Remediation, painful as it is from the big players, will eventually happen. New fintechs in this area at the moment are still chasing a profit and it's a beguilingly shifting competitive landscape out there. It's worth taking a look at what's going on in Britain at the moment where they're further along the curve of cultural change after the financial crisis revealed a lot of bad behaviour there as well. But today, a lack of good available financial advice is emerging as a failing in its own right. Interesting then that a fellow like Jeff Lloyd last year, at the height of the Royal Commission, decided to take on the job of running MLC, which includes NAB's financial advice business. It's being spun off by the bank at some stage soon. But Jeff Lloyd sees opportunity where NAB clearly can't. Our interview just ahead. Let's head to politics today because it's all happening. Opposition leader Bill Shorten is set to deliver his income tax counterpunch to the coalition when he delivers his budget rebuttal at 7.30 p.m. tonight. Sky News pol political reporter James O'Doherty is standing by in Canberra for that one. What are we to expect, James, and what's the government been up to? Dickie, we can expect bigger tax cuts for lower-income Australians. Now, remember Bill Shorten... Uh, put a, a budget reply speech uh, to the parliament last year with his tax plan and his tax cut plan. That will remain essentially the same tonight, but that includes uh, bigger tax cuts for lower income Australians. The government's plan out in the forwards, 2024-25, includes tax cuts for people earning up to $200,000. It would see mm. uh, th th those individuals uh, receiving a tax cut of more than $11,000 for in four years' time. Now, Labor is expected to uh, clamp down on some of those uh, tax cuts for higher-income Australians, targeting more funding and more tax cuts at the lower end. So we won't see such a flattening of the tax rate from Labor. We will still see structured tax rates with more relief directed at lower-income Australians. 
Right, OK. So, uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a way, it's the old war on this particular tax break mm. area, isn't it, and tax reform area. Uh, what I gather the government has actually tried to preempt Bill Shorten's speech. Sure has. They've put around in the press gallery a 16-page glossy pamphlet, as we like to say in the business, uh, some spin uh, that says essentially that Labor is going to have a whole new set of taxes. They're calling it the little book of Labor's big taxes. We know the government uh, says that Labor has a $200 billion tax burden that comes from the $54 billion it will reap uh, from clamping down on uh, franking dividend imputation credits in the first financial year and clamp downs on negative gearing as well. So this uh, glossy brochure from the government essentially saying that uh, Labor in government would tax you more. The government's message today has been very simply that under a uh, Scott Morrison government you'll get a tax cut and your overall uh, tax burden will not increase. Uh, James, now that we're a couple of days away from the budget, uh, I was down there with you um, and when we were literally pouring out of the lock-up. How has the dust settled? Do we think that it's going to make much difference to the polls come Monday? A lot of commentators have been pointing out to the fact that you just don't get a budget bounce these days, Tiki. Mm. You don't get that. Uh, what you may have seen in the past, an uptick in the polls from an election year budget in which the cash usually does get splashed around. The only change you may see, people have been speculating, is a, a decline in the polls for Scott Morrison if the budget cell doesn't go particularly well. We've already seen a little bit of a backflip on this emergency, uh, energy assistance payments now going to people on the dole. That's only going to cost $80 million more, so the government dealt with that pretty swiftly. But look, there is also a, a feeling, Tiki, that because the election is uh, so close now, more people may be tuning in to politics right at this moment and paying a bit more attention to this budget because the election is so close. So that might get them looking at some of the measures in that budget. And Scott Morrison would be hoping that the headline figure of $158 billion in tax cuts with $1,000 more in your pocket each year will be getting the public excited about voting for the coalition next month. Mm, well, we'll see what happens on Monday. James Atterty, great to talk. Thank you. Let's go back now to that interview with MLC Chief Executive Jeff Lloyd. Jeff took up the job running NAB's up for sale wealth management business, including financial planning, last July. Really just as the Royal Commission was building up a head of steam, his job is to get MLC ship shaped for sale with a priority on reparations in financial planning. I spoke with him earlier. Jeff Lloyd, good to catch up. Now, you've actually advised NAB not to go ahead and fast track the MLC sale. Why have you done that? Yeah, we had a discussion with the board around where the business was at. You know, our priority is to make sure that we've remediated our clients, to make sure that we have a strong business and one that's ready to exit. So in my mind, you know, it was about timing. It's about us making sure that the business is strong. Um, there's a lot for us to do. We're working through separation, but it's important for us to stay a little bit longer. Now we have the certainty uh, post the Royal Commission to actually act. Yes, the, Co the Commonwealth Bank has made a similar decision about its demerger, uh, wanting to focus on remediation. Now we've, we've also had the ASIC report, which has come down pretty disappointed on the progress made on re remediation. Is this uh, your number one focus now? Yeah, it's my priority to restore our clients. You know, the, the, the Royal Commission shone a light on the whole industry um, and shone a light on mistakes that the industry had made. It shone a light on mistakes that MLC has made. So my first priority will be to restore our clients, to ensure that they are remediated, but also to give them the confidence in MLC going forward as well. And how can you make sure there's not a, another asset report that comes down and said, look, you know, they're just not doing it fast enough? Well, importantly for us, it's about resourcing it properly getting the right skills and experience, partnering, making sure that we do it quality first. Uh, we have to make sure that our clients are restored properly the first time and that's my priority. Can't be about getting it right and then hopefully later finding out that something else has ha not happened. We've got to get it right the first time. So by the end of 2020 it is, you're hoping that this deal will have been done? Well, yeah, that's exactly what we've announced. We've said that we're on track for separation. We've started that work 
Uh, we started the remediation work and continuing to accelerate it. My, my job is to accelerate that wherever I can, but at the same time to make the MLC even stronger, modernise it. We've done a number of activities since September that have actually returned value to our clients, made us a much stronger competitor in the market as well. Jeff, you're going ahead with financial planning. NAB says it can't make money out of financial planning. It doesn't seem to have a vision for financial planning. Why in this market do you think financial planning is the place to be? Well, look, I've been doing this for coming on 30 years. And when I look out and I think about Australians' need for good advice, the complexity of retirement in Australia today, you know, particularly if you get focused on the over 45s, you know, they're about to inherit more than any other generation in this country. Um, Australians need good advice, access to quality advice. Uh, we've restated our commitment to advice. Uh, we're going to commit to the way we deliver advice much differently to the way we have in the past, about focus, being in the right place, focusing on the right clients. So for us, um, we've committed to advice we think it is changing, we think Australians need it, um, and we're happy to be there. So, post Hain, the Royal Commission, financial advice obviously is going to be changing. You're going to have to say whether you're uh, fully independent or not. There are other rules uh, you're going to have to look to. Now, what do you think this is going to do to the cost of financial advice for the average person? No, look, no doubt it's difficult in this country to provide general advice. We've debated the difference between general and personal advice for a long time. Um, it's very expensive and the costs are going to grow. Uh, the risk profile has grown. The ability to actually deliver that um, in a safe way for clients and a safe way for our business is our priority. But I have to believe that the professional advice is going to offer that outcome to Australians because the need is there. No in terms of value for money? Absolutely. No different to the way lawyers and accountants at that highest level of professionalism provide their services to Australians today and I think advice can do the same. I was speaking with James Shipton at ASIC the other day and clearly ASIC is wrestling as well with exactly what is general advice and what is personal advice. What would your advice be to them? Well look I think for government actually we need to help the regulators and industry better answer that question. Um, we've seen this in the UK post uh, the changes that happened in the UK over five years ago, we've seen a lot of the banks leave advice and we've seen UK residents now actually need and ask for more advice. So why can't we get in front of that in this country, provide that clarity, that clarity will allow people to get different points of advice at different stages in their life. Beyond financial advice you've also got uh, three other divisions don't you? Yeah, we're lucky at MLC. We've got a diversified portfolio of businesses. We've just rolled out our new strategy and that's about four pillars. And those pillars are individually strong and we think collectively even stronger. And that allows us to bring those products and services to clients as their needs change. So we're in platforms, we're in corporate super, uh, we're in retirement services and we're in asset management. With the rise of fintech, why should customers stick with an organisation like MLC when uh, some of these opportunities would appear exciting and, and apparently cheaper? Look, I think in the short term it's about us making sure that we've re-established the confidence in our clients. But over the medium to long term, it's going to be about capability, skills and experience. It's about judgement, you know, and for, for us we'd love to be a partner as well with any fintech, any regtech provider because we see that need and, and that capability of partnership being one of the measures of success for our business. So you're going actively forward. looking out in the market at different fintechs are you? Absolutely, we, we think that as we create that opportunity around our brand, our business and what our client needs are why wouldn't we partner with someone who can help us deliver that? Yeah, now you've got uh, outflows uh, more than your inflows at the moment. How do you turn that around, especially uh, when the itch sector for investment seems to be industry super at the moment? Hmm. Look, I think it's about superannuation for Australians, making sure that they get confidence in their ability to plan for and live well in retirement. It's complex. We all live messy, different lives. And, you know, as this generation inherit more wealth, then their lives are going to get more complex. And it's not just about the product of super, it's about the concept of retirement. Um, that's about aged care, that's about health care. It's not just about my financial needs. And we'd love to see how we can help our clients retire better, not just with their super, but all the other aspects of their life. And, and just going back to fees at the moment, because that in the Royal Commission, indeed the Productivity Commission report, uh, revealed that uh, that was the, the issue for comparing many in the industry fund sector with the retail sector. Now, how do you counter that on fees? Oh, look, I think it's about value. 
You know, it's actually about value and performance um, of the underlying fund, but also the connection that those clients need with that trusted provider. Um, and that you're with them for life as their life stages change. And our My Super products, we've just made some recent changes to that. They're quite uh, market breaking. Um, we think that we've invested really heavily in our asset management team, got strong capability there and a really strong track record. So for us, it's actually about bringing value to clients, but it's at those different really important inflections of their life that they need advice or they need super or they need retirement services. One of the things raised in the AFAR's Banking and Wealth Summit was the uh, concern raised about this credit squeeze. Is that something we should be worrying about? Well, I think when we look at our clients, you know, when we try to segment them, um, they'd be more worried about the complexity of retirement. You know, the anxiety that you get in that sort of five to ten years pre-retirement about have I planned for this properly? How am I going to deal with all my assets? And then that five to ten years post-retirement, that's a very anxious time as well. So we see that as the real opportunity to create value for our clients. Yeah, yeah, you've got the worrying question for savers. That's right. Yeah. Budget generally, how did you see that? Well, I suppose it's a predictable budget in one sense. It's, it's strong if you like. It's great for us to be able to get back into a surplus as a country. You know, we need to all stand up and help our economy grow. Um, over the medium to long term, it'll be interesting to see how those savings are deployed. Um, and I would hope that Australians really look to their long-term planning, not short-term needs. Some concerns from the business community about the lack of investment in uh, research and development, in innovation. Well, it's about priorities, I suspect. You know, we've, we've got to get this economy back into the black. Um, it's important for us to, though, as industry, to participate in that. So what can we do as industry to push on regardless? Yeah, yeah. So you would be very supportive of the surplus that's... Um being forecast. I think it's just a different state of mind for the country. I think it's time for us to lift. I think it's time for us to invest again. And that will deliver business confidence. You think the surplus is very much part of delivering business confidence? I think it helps business get that confidence, particularly small business. You know, it's the backbone of this country. We need to support it and confidence comes over time but you need to build momentum. Finally, Jeff, going back to the company, uh, by 2022, do you think MLC will be um, a listed company floated out there um, in, the, in the public environment, or do you think you'll be behind the curtain as private equity? Oh, look, I think we've been pretty open with that. Um, we've said all along that we're open to all options, um, and those options are ones about strength in the business for our shareholders. Um, and for our clients getting that right. So um, we've been pretty clear on that. Jeff Lloyd, so good to get your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. After the break, Grain Corp set for a demerger. We'll get the latest from the Australians. John Dury next. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, embattled super funds manager IOOF has announced the exit of managing director Chris Kelleher. Mr Kelleher and Chair George Venado stepped aside in December following legal action by APRA. The bank regulators sought to force the pair out of the industry in the wake of shocking appearances at the Hain Royal Commission. APRA argued Mr Kelleher and four senior executives were not, quote, fit and proper people and should never again be at the helm of a super company. IOOF is currently facing a shareholder class action. After it emerged, the wealth manager's top brass may have knowingly breached their trustee duties and superannuation laws. Mr Kelleher will walk away with a final payment of $1.27 million. Now, Grain Corp says it is looking to separate its malting business into a new company which will be listed on the ASX. The new company, dubbed Malt Co, will consist of Grain Corp's malting and craft brewing distribution businesses. The company says if the separation goes through, the company's shareholders will receive Malt Co shares in proportion to their shareholdings in Grain Corp, while also retaining their Grain Corp shares. Well, for more on that story, I'm pleased to welcome the Australian senior writer, John Jury, who joins me live from Melbourne. John, what an interesting development this actually is. And uh, you give a lot of credit in terms of uh, value uh, creation to the incumbents. 
Yeah, no, I, I think the board's made a very good decision. I'm, I'm probably being very generous on my multiples, but in, in, in round terms, this values the more business at about two billion, the grains business at about eight hundred to a billion, and mm. um, at the at, at the start of the day, Grain Corp was valued at two billion for the lot. So th this is a really is a value creating deal. So take us back because, of course, uh, Grain Corp has been of interest to a couple of parties. Uh, first of all, uh, Tony Shepherd and uh, Crash Craddock. Well, well, it has. In fact, I, if you look even further back, about five years ago, Joe Hockey, the then treasurer, knocked back a bid for Grain Corp, which was valued at thirteen dollars twenty. And mm. I'm saying right now, the company w with the Malt Co deal could be worth thirteen dollars a share. So we should put that in a little bit of context uh -huh. but you're right Tony Tony Shepard and Chris Craddock they, they've um, they've got a derivatives based proposal which is meant to iron out their cyclical earnings of the grain business and and they've got a bit on the table of ten dollars forty two a share now to my way of thinking whatever way you look at it the proposal brought up by the board today means that they're going to have to increase their offer if they want to get to square one Mm. John Wiley's uh, friendly uh, activist activities have anything to do with this? Do you think yeah. he took their advice? Uh, sorry, they took uh, his advice? Well, well, if you talk to John, the answer is yes. <laughs> and so, but but um, I'm, I'm sure they took, um, they took his advice and they took Ashok Jacobs' advice and mm. uh, they would have taken um, Perpetual's advice but, and certainly they would have taken Macquarie, their advisor's advice. But, I, you know, but, um, Grain Corp will tell you they've been looking at this sort of deal for 18 months, so I'm sure they've taken uh, advice from a range of parties. And no matter whose idea it was, I think at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a great deal for all shareholders. Right, so essentially it's, yeah. it's unlocking the value of, of the malt business for shareholders. Where does this That's put right. uh, the Tony Shepherd? Uh, camp. Do you think they'll come in and lob another bid in? Well, well th they wanted the whole company to, to, to stay a as a whole. But I mean, mm. th th their bid stacks up. Eh? Their bid stacks up if it's just the Grain Corp thing. But I, I, ironically enough, uh, Grain Corp have sort of stolen their idea, if you like, which was a derivative play based on around an insurance contract which the, the, the Grain Corp earnings really uh, fluctuate. Uh, last year it was about 70 million, the year before that it was over 200 million. It's amazing, and this yeah. All depend, yeah, it all depends on how big the... Uh, the roughly 10 million tonnes uh, of wheat a year are needed for the domestic market supplied by the East Coast and uh, sometimes the, the, the crop is up to 20 million so that means 10 million gets exported and that's a, a bumpy year for Grain Corp but last year wasn't so good so that's, so that's why you need the derivatives contract that, uh, remember about you know uh, back in 2009 that's why Grain Corp bought the mall business and then a couple of years later the, the oils business because it wanted uh, steady cash flow to, to match the the in unpredictable earnings from 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 the uh, from the grain and so mm. it, it, it so they're using the derivatives contract in, instead of a, a real business like malt. Right. So so really, the the way forward is for shareholders to sign off on Graham Bradley's deal. I, well, absolutely. I, I, well, let's wait and see. There's a, there's a, a deadline of um, May the 10th for the um, Tony Shepherd deal, which is um, because that was the day that um, a, a few weeks ago, Grain Corp also announced that they're selling their, their uh, bulk liquids terminals to a crowd called ANZ Terminals. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that deal, that deal um, kicks off from uh, May the 10th and so that's really been regarded as the drop dead date for the for the Tony Shepherd's deal so let's see what what happens on that day yeah but do you think uh, you know broadly where do you see this going is is the Tony Shepherd option still alive I guess is what I'm asking yeah 
Well, well, I, well, I, I think if the Tony Shepherd's offer is still alive, he, he's got to increase his offer because 1042 yeah. just isn't going to cut it. Yes. I, I'm really, and I, I would imagine that that malt is in uh, high demand around the world right now for a couple of reasons. In in Scotland, uh, whiskey's going gangbusters because the Chinese <laughs> have discovered a liking for it. In, in the US and really around the world, craft beer is getting popular. And so m malt is, is, is a big, is a high priced commodity right now, you know, for however long that lasts. Mm. And so I wouldn't be at all surprised if by year, um, Grain Corp have said that their deal w will happen at the end of this year, but it wouldn't surprise if other bids came in ahead of that time. So I'm thinking by calendar year end, that we might have the Tony Shepherd proposal or, or we'll have a, another bid for, for the malt business. And any way you look at it, I think it's a great day for Grain Corp shareholders. I agree with you 100%. Okay. John Jerry, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. After the break, ticketing trouble for Viagogo, Viagogo's global CEO, Chris Miller, next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Welcome back. Well, let's look at the ticketing sector now. Via Gogo, a controversial Swiss-based ticket reselling platform, you may have heard of them, has had a tough time with regulators in Australia around the world, accused, accused of charging hidden fees, price gouging and selling fake tickets. I confess I've been a victim. A UK parliamentary committee recently warned consumers from using the website in Australia Labour is promising to ban Viagogo and other ticket resellers from charging more than 10% above the base price. Well, Viagogo's boss, Chris Miller, is in the country to defend their position, and he spoke to Your Money Chief Business Reporter, Leah Shanahan, earlier. All right, Chris Miller, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, look, you've had problems with regulators in Australia, the UK, Italy and New Zealand. A UK parliamentary committee recently told customers warning against the use of Viagogo. Why should you be allowed to operate in Australia? Uh, in Australia, well, actually, the thing is, we have uh, we run a ticket exchange platform, um, and what we do is we provide uh, the ability for both buyers and sellers to resell tickets in a safe and secure environment. And I think that the reality is, is that we have engaged uh, with a number of these regulators to explain more it is about our business. We have to do a, a better job of educating, um, you know, the sort of um, the, the specifics about how the industry works, not just about ticket resale, but also overall the primary market, live events, et cetera. Um, and we provide a really great service. I mean, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of the only places that you have, uh, the buyers have access to um, high demand events. Um, it's one of the last choices, for instance, you get to choose which location you get to sit in. Um, you get to be able to, uh, if you miss the on sale, you still have an opportunity to go to the event. So we believe it's a, a beneficial service for lots of fans. Okay, so a major critic of yours in Australia is a, is a Labor front bencher, a big music fan, uh, Tony Burke. He's likely to be a cabinet minister in a uh, possible Labor government. He tweeted out last year, never rely on Viagogo, only buy tickets by going to the page of the artist or venue and follow the links. There are too many stories of rip-offs and fake tickets from resellers. He cited one example of being taken to a Paul McCartney concert on your website, which it turned out to be a Paul McCartney cover band. Uh, how do you respond to those kind of critics in, in politics? Well, it's disappointing. We'd like the opportunity to be able to sit down with Mr. Burke and explain more about the business. Um, the truth is, is that less than 1% of the tickets on our website uh, do actually have a problem. And what we do is, in these really rare instances, we step in the middle of that transaction and, and try to find a suitable replacement. Um, the resale market exists with or without us. Um, what, we're, what we're doing is filling a gap to make sure that things are more safe and secure. So with, if there is a, a, a problem, like I said, uh, we offer a suitable replacement ticket in the sort of really rare extreme circumstances we have to provide a refund. We understand that that's a total disaster and uh, doesn't really mitigate a lot of the stress associated with it. But uh, without us and you know, people will go to other channels such as Facebook Marketplace or they might go to Twitter or you know, potentially back to the streets and we think that we're a better solution or better alternative. All right. Can people buy fake tickets through Viagogo? 
So we don't pay the seller until after the event, um, and so there's no incentive for the sellers, the independent third parties that list tickets on our website to uh, put up fake tickets or tickets that um, wouldn't be valid because uh, they just simply won't get paid. So no, that that would be a, a, a you know that wouldn't be the case. Okay, so another big problem or a major criticism of your website has been the types of fees. This is what the ACCC has looked into in Australia, uh, booking fees and handling fees, sometimes up to 30% extra on the price. Are your fees disclosed adequately or are they there to rip off customers? Uh, we believe that they're there uh, to be adequate and, and it's uh, important to understand that there's, uh, our fees are actually less than the primary market in a lot of cases. Um, and we do a lot more. So we are uh, a platform that provides a peer-to-peer -peer management of uh, payment processing. Uh, there's customer service that supports it behind it. Uh, we take risk on the transaction. So if there is a problem, uh, we go into our own pocket and we actually replace that ticket at our own cost. In some cases, if there's a dispute between the buyer and the seller, we, we pay both the seller and uh, refund the buyer at, at our own cost. So we think the fees are appropriate. Okay. Now, some say you're basically just you're just a digital scalping agency. Uh, the use of uh, of mass uh, digital programs, whereby computer programs, whereby tickets are bought up on mass and then placed on your website. Is there any way you can restrict the use of those programs? Well, so the the reality is is that we don't um, you know approve of any uh, of any sort of unfair technical advantages and. Um, would actually support any legislation that would would outlaw these, you know, I think what you're uh, uh, um, outlining are called bots. Um, the bots, what they do is they actually target the primary market. Um, they use the uh, these systems to uh, acquire tickets directly from, you know, the ticket techs and ticket masters of the world. And we'd be happy to to partner with them um, and collaborate and, 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 you know, work with them if they identify the use of this technology, if, if, if that happens to be a seller that's on our website, and obviously work with them to, uh, to remove that and stamp this uh, technology out. Okay, well, the, the uh, future Labor government or a possible Labor government has proposed uh, introducing a 10% uh, cap on uh, payments made through the Via Gogo and other ticket reseller types on from the base price of, of tickets. Uh, you're against that. Isn't that, that a fair measure, though, to protect the consumer? Well, we understand the spirit behind it, but I think if you look at the practical reality of, of um, you know, the sort of the supply demand economics behind it, as well as um, the circumstances of what you will see is that without us, um, you know, the, that it, it regulating a, a place like Viagogo, you're going to end up driving customers uh, to the black market or to a, to a market at least that's, that doesn't have any protection like it was before we existed. So that would be going to the street and potentially buying some, uh, something off the, um, you know, a street seller. It could be going to Twitter. It could be going to Facebook. It's incredibly difficult to, um, and to enforce that. And, and the reality is, is that there's no protection there. So with our website, you know, you, you, you're getting a, a, a sort of a documented transaction. Um, you know, sellers are obligated to, um, you know, to, to fill that transaction. And we step in the middle and provide the customer service. And if there's any problems, you know, obviously there's a refund. So we think it's better to go through a secure platform like ours and, and you know, working with the government to, uh, to address other concerns that they might have. But usually the, the, this, what we see in the United States and in other markets, even the UK, the price caps just simply don't work. Mm. Okay, and you're, you're meeting with politicians and uh, others in Australia at the moment. What's the response been like? Uh, have, you, have you any concerns that you could be banned from operating in Australia? Well, I think that the, the concern would be is that the fan, um, you know, would be left out. The, the reality is, is that, um, you know, the, the event organizers and primary market don't offer refunds. So, you know, what is the alternative if you don't have a platform like ours to be able to resell a ticket? There's many, many instances where people have reasons why they can't make it. These events go on sale nine months in advance and, you know, lots of people have no idea when they're going to be nine months and, and, and not giving them an alternative uh, to resell is, is, is one piece. So you have to look at that. The second thing is, is that, um, you know, look, there's, it's a complicated market. There's a lot of things that go into it. The event organizers and primary market allocate tickets to sponsors and, and uh, there's venue holds, there's insider holds, there's, there's all sorts of things which end up on our, our, on our marketplace as well. So I think the, the truth is, is that um, what, what I'm here to do and what we'll continue to do is, is, is sit down with um, MPs and other people in the government and, and explain to them all the realities of the business and, and not only how our site works and, and what we're willing to do, but also making sure they understand that of how the uh, overall event, or, um, the event industry works as well, because it's important that you really dig in and learn more about it. All right. Well, Chris Miller, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.
Now to where footy meets funds management. Andrew Thompson played over 200 games with St Kilda from 97 to 2007, a best and fairest winner with the Saints. But he was drafted pretty late uh, when he was already 24 and with a family in Broking and a good job in finance. Today, Andrew Thompson runs the growth fund for Lucerne, the company he co-founded just over three years ago for his high net worth clients with a business model that fits pretty well with the world post the Royal Commission. I spoke to him from Melbourne. Andrew Thompson, so nice to talk to you. Uh, look, I wonder, can you tell me about your firm, why you created it? Because it seems to be a very interesting space in the, in the light of the Royal Commission. Yeah, hi Tiki. Uh, yeah, so the background of the firm is we um, came out of Canaccord, so decided to start our own business on the back of trying to get some independence. Um, I think when you, you, when you look through some of the uh, broking firms and the way they have operated over a long period of time, it's ob obviously the, the research is driven a, a lot by the, uh, by the corporate uh, desk, corporate department. So mm. as much as we enjoyed working at Canaccord at the time, we decided that getting a, uh, starting an independent wealth management firm, and we've been running the wealth management department at Canaccord for uh, a couple of years as a team, mm. But yeah, it was more about getting that independence and starting our own business and not being aligned to any of, uh, any of the conflicts that, um, that sometimes can, can come out. And we saw it you know, with the results of the Royal Commission. If we can stay completely uh, conflict free, uh, independent, not take commissions from anyone other than um, you know, charging our clients a funds under management uh, fee and try and find the best investments for them. And I think uh, if you look at the returns that um, we had as brokers, and perhaps it was a um, perhaps it was a little bit of an indication of our ability as brokers. But we're essentially getting research, which uh, everyone tends to get that research these days, yeah. and making calls on based on on the information that's coming in. And clients all had different portfolios, and the results of you know some of those portfolios weren't weren't as good as what we have been able to achieve when we've gone and found specialist fund managers who can um, focus on one part of the market, whether it's you know, small cap, mid cap, international, you know, long, short. Yes. And then we also have a, 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 um, a manager, Marcus Bogdan, who appears on Your Money quite frequently. He looks after our ASX 200 exposure. And I, I say to clients, I, I spend a lot of my time actually spending, um, you know, catching up with the clients and going through portfolio reviews. Uh, whereas Marcus spends all his time out speaking to companies and trying to find the best ones to invest in. And, yeah, the, the returns that he's had, particularly in down markets, has, has been quite compelling. So, so yeah, that, that's the reason we started the business. And um, so far, we've been going for three and a half years and it's been growing quite strongly. So uh, this is the, the sort of fund of funds that, that you run. Uh, what sort of returns are we talking about over the last three years? Well, I think the fund of funds is, is just a part of the business and that's mm -hmm. been running for 12 months. Uh, but what, we're, what we've actually tried to build is a number of different investment options for clients. So they can go into the uh, long only ASX 200 uh, exposure through, through um, Blackmore Capital, which was run by Marcus. Yes. Then the fund of funds is, um, is an aspect and that's predominantly got alternatives in it at the moment. And the reason it has the alternatives is to co try and complement the long only exposure the clients have got through, through the ASX 200. And then we also build some uh, other funds around the client's portfolio because some of the high net worth clients are, are keen to get some directional exposure. So they might want to have a larger exposure to small mid caps, they might want to have larger exposure to something like TOTUS uh, who has a, you know, been a very successful uh, long short manager particularly on the short side or someone like Bronte who is predominantly long short overseas international uh, exposure. So the, the, invest, uh, the, the returns you know, clearly where the uh, fund of funds is trying to get returns of around about 8% but it's always going to be driven by the markets and particularly with what happened in the uh, last quarter last year internationally, the mm. markets all got sold off uh, reasonably hard and that's going to impact returns but also the, uh, the, the ability to um, recover from those returns uh, which has happened in, in this quarter this year has, has been quite strong. But and, and what about the, what the long only exposure, to give you some, yes. sorry, to give you some numbers, Marcus Bogdan's uh, returned about 7% uh, across both his SMA portfolios uh, which just sits about 
uh, 2.5% above the ASX 200 accumulation index for this financial year. Okay, so um, how do you, you see value investing or how do your clients see value investing at a moment in, in, a, in a market really where broader investment, index hugging, uh, you know, it, it's not that hard to do reasonably well or hasn't been in the recent past? Yeah, it kind of makes us all look very smart at the moment because you can, <laughs> you can invest in the market and it just seems to keep going up. But really, uh, the thing that um, we try and highlight to clients is when the market falls, as we saw it fall in, in February, March last year, and then obviously in the December quarter, mm. is to try and protect the capital. So if you've got good quality companies in your long-only uh, portfolio, uh, particularly in the ASX 200, then you, know, you tend to be able to protect some of the, um, some of the wealth based on the companies that you invest in. Uh, and then the other thing is if you've got some exposure to alternatives, long shorts, the long shorts should outperform in that part of the market. And Lucerne growth, which is the fund of funds, if you go back to March last year, the market was down 3.7%. Uh, Lucerne growth was down 038 So it just gives a bit of a higher base to, to right. bounce off from. But if you, if you look at the exposure that we've had in the ASX 200, uh, Value investing has been, if, if you break it up into, into three parts, you've got growth investing, um, you know, the value investing, and then Marcus Bogdan also looks at uh, value at a, at a decent price, and um, sorry, quality at a decent price. So value has been the lowest um, performer out of those three, three different um, uh, ways of looking at the market. Uh, growth has clearly been the best. but. The, the greatest issue that I think uh, the fund managers that we use at the moment have got is they say, well, do we just keep chasing uh, growth at any price? And Afterpay has been an example of a stock which has been tremendous and I've followed it since it was uh, $4 and it's been a, a great stock for some of our clients. But it gets hard to understand you know, a $5.5 .5 billion market cap yeah. and the share price is about $23.40 and last year I think it lost $20 million. So yes. um, I think it's a brilliant uh, uh, company and the, the idea behind it is outstanding. It's just a question of, well, do you, do you keep holding it or do you chase it when it's already had a run? And, and, and that's a difficult decision that the fund managers have got to, um, to you know, All right. make. All right. Now, another part of your business, obviously, is um, is uh, M and A. Um, now, you yes. uh, have quite an interesting approach as well to mergers and acquisitions, and uh, I, I gather you're looking quite. Uh, well, some of your clients are quite closely at the West Farmers play with Liners. Well, yeah, so um, we mainly leave the M&A activity to Harvest Lane. It's an event-driven fund manager based out of Sydney. Right. And they look at any, any M&A activity and then they'll decide whether they're going to enter the market and buy the stock once the deal's been announced. And for the most part, that actually works out pretty well. Uh, they've had, had reasonably strong returns since they've been running the fund, but they can also get caught out. And we, we saw uh, Macmillan Shakespeare walk away from Eclipse and, and that obviously hurt some of the managers that were holding Eclipse and, and part of that deal. But yes, we do have some clients who were quite uh, interested in the lithium and rare earth space, particularly when it was running hard uh, 18 months ago. And some of the clients still hold Linus. And when Wes Farmers put that surprise bid in uh, for Linus at $2.25, I think stock was trading about $1.60 at the time, I clearly got a couple, uh, couple of clients reasonably excited. Uh, also a couple of our fund, manage, uh, fund managers, um, you know, Newgate's one and I know L1 is another. Uh, but hold Linus, obviously, you know, those types of things help, but it's very hard to predict. I don't think anyone in the market really saw Wes Farmers as a, uh, as a suitor for Linus. Yes. But yeah, it's nice when it, when it plays out that way. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, can I ask a little bit more about you as well um, while I've got you? I mean, there have been examples in the past. I think Fitzy Mike Fitzpatrick, uh, off he went to Hastings. Um, but there you are. You played uh, over 200 games in, uh, uh, in, in a decade um, as, a, as a midfielder, best and fairest. I mean, how does that uh, play into, if you like, uh, your relationship with clients and your own credibility in, in the workplace? Yeah, so uh, I could probably take up most of your program talking about how I got into the AFL because it took a long time. So I, I'm a little bit different. I, uh, um, I didn't get drafted until I was 24, so I already had um, experience of working uh, full time. Uh, I got drafted and, and played for 11 years, but I also worked all through my football career. So I originally started work at AB Namro Morgans and then went to a company called BGF, which became Canaccord, and then we started Lucerne. So right. uh, very unusual, reasonably unusual for players to be able to find time to work during their career, but it, it certainly helped in the transition. Uh, and look, it's interesting speaking to clients, some of them say that when you're out on the football field, you obviously have to make quick decisions about what you're going to do out, out on the ground. And 
uh, some people have said that that has helped in terms of when you're making decisions on stocks because you, you actually have to make a call sometimes reasonably quickly on it uh, and maybe, maybe the uh, experience of, of having to make quick decisions out on the ground has it's transpired but really it's about the, the relationships that I formed during my football career mm -hmm. and the ability to go and um, you know, speak, to, speak to different people and, and get introduced to different people and it's a great way of breaking the ice. Uh, Mike Fitzpatrick's probably done a little bit better than me at this point in time. I think he was a Rhodes Scholar as well. And, uh, well, so uh, far, you've got, got a bit of a way to go. Business. <laughs> so I can, I, I'm, I'm going to try and replicate what he's been able to achieve. But yeah. uh, look, I, the, the footy career was, was something that I absolutely loved and would have kept doing for as long as I could. But yeah. the body breaks down and you've got to move into another field. And I will say one other thing. I used to go to the floor of the exchange when I was uh, eight and nine years of age with my father, who was a broker, and my brother was a broker, so it's kind of in the blood. And uh, I've slightly moved away from that breaking side to, to get into wealth management, and yeah. so far I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. And what about your Saints? Uh, what two two up already? Are they going to go all the way? <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, they've got the flag under <laughs> <laughs> under control. I think. <laughs> Look. Um, well, yeah. Look. Great to win the first two games, yeah. and uh, we won four and a half games last year. Yes. There's been a bit of a change down there. I've, I've just finished on the board after being on the board for 11 years, so yeah. um, maybe the fact that I left has suddenly seen some success. <laughs> come well, they, on the they, field, they're coming up. They're certainly doing a lot better than my team up here in Sydney. I've got to say. Yeah, I think Sydney will be okay. They've been a great side for a long period of time, so <laughs> you probably had some great times in, uh, supporting them over the last decade. Oh, we have indeed. But I look forward to our next clash. Andrew Thompson, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, okay, thanks. Once now, after the break, MPs in the UK have voted to ask for an extension to the Brexit process in a bid to avoid any no deal scenario. We'll get up to speed with CEO of the Australian British Chamber of Commerce, David McCready, next. Now, back to Tiki. Welcome back. Well, the British Parliament has approved a bill that would appear to rule out a no-deal Brexit by forcing the government to seek an extension from the EU if it cannot pass a divorce plan by April 12. Well, for more on this, pleased to welcome back yet again David McCready, CEO of the Australian British Chamber of Commerce, who is our top analyst as we go on. It's just the gift that keeps on giving Brexit, isn't it, for all of us? Uh, what's happening, David? Well, very clearly, uh, you know, we, we know that they got set new timelines. They have to have a deal uh, approved by the 12th of April or a, a sign of a deal being approved and then they could extend to the 22nd of May. Mm. Uh, obviously, the deal didn't pass last week when it was brought to the House. We've had more meaningful votes and they haven't really, uh, sorry, more indicative votes yes. and they haven't really drawn any conclusions either. And then Yvette Cooper, Remainer, ex-Labor Minister, yes. has put this bill up for a, a, an extent, go and request an extension to the withdrawal, and that got through. It did, by one vote. Yeah. Uh, and on the back of about 14 Tories crossing the floor to vote with the Labor Party, and the is that going to, and It's got to get through the Lords, is it? It does have to go through is the that Lords. Is problem there? No. Uh, I don't think so, mm. given that uh, what we saw when Article 50 was debated and other things have been debated around Brexit in the, the House of Lords, I think there are enough numbers there to send it back to the Commons in its current form. Right. Then it'll go back to the Commons. Goes back to the Commons and then off for royal assent. Yes. But. But there's yes. a big caveat. Yes. It's fine for the British Parliament to say we'd like a further extension. Yes. Uh, which Theresa May on her own can go and request. Uh, however, the EU doesn't have to accept that or, um, or but, work with it but either. But I would have thought the bigger fear now is because the last thing the EU wants to do is not accept an, an, and extend, an extension and then be blamed for a no deal because it would be they that then force the no deal scenario. So presumably they are going to say, yeah, sure, we'll have an extension. We'll have a, like a 10 year extension or a, two, <laughs> or a two year extension. And essentially Britain won't leave for a long, long time. Well, potentially. I don't think that, I don't think a 10 year extension no, I'm being, is likely. I'm exaggerating, I think you're, yes. Uh, taking a little <laughs> bit of liberty there. But, uh, but certainly, look, there's certainly been a lot of discussion in the last uh, 24, 48 hours, and indeed probably over the last few days, particularly since uh, the Prime Minister made the, the very unusual step of saying, OK, we can't seem to pass my deal. Yes. Uh, we'll get 
Jeremy Corbyn and the Labor side into number 10. We'll have a conversation. They had one yesterday. It lasted an hour and 40 minutes. Mm. Um, That's about a softer Brexit. We're talking at, we're, we've now got the idea that some of the red lines, Theresa May's red lines, might move. From well, Jeremy Cox, no less. Is that right? From Jeremy Corbyn or Geoffrey Cox? Oh, so Geoffrey Cox, From Geoffrey Cox, yes. yeah. So, well, Geoffrey Cox is very keen to see, and, and he, uh, reminding everybody he's the mm. Attorney General whose yes. advice... Yes, ..whose advice actually sunk the deal... Correct. Two, uh, uh, ..two sittings ago. But he's now saying the lines could move. Well, potentially. Um, if you've got to get a deal, you've got to find a way to yeah. negotiate a compromise. And, sure. and uh, whilst you might have some fairly firm ideas about what you will and won't compromise, when you come down to the end of a negotiation, those things amazing. get tested. Amazing. Now, look, as the uh, fellow in charge of promoting trade between Britain and Australia, I thought you might be amused, if you haven't seen it already, with the budgie smugglers advert. Here's a little bit of a clip I think we've got, David. Britain, we hear it's almost time to say au revoir to Europe. So, if you're going to Brexit the EU, why not Brenta the AU? What a union that would be. Just imagine if we combined our sporting talents. You could teach us how to bowl, handle pressure, and how to drive. If you're going to hit the beach down here, you'll need some sunscreen and a new pair of budgie smugglers. Because those weird Euro bathers you got, they're just not going to cut it. Anyways, give it some thought and get back to us. And good luck on leaving the EU. Chat to you soon. Love you lots. Your mate Australia. Any surprise they want to leave the Brexiteers with those sort of Eurobathers? Uh... <laughs> I'm not going to make it in common uh, fashion. I don't think that's my area of expertise. But, but, I mean, look, that's opportunistic trade for you. But look, the bottom line, of course, is um, if, <laughs> if they do end up uh, not leaving, uh, there is no free trade deal. We've got to remind ourselves with, with, with Britain, then it goes through the European f free trade deal. Yeah, so we're negotiating a free trade agreement with the EU concurrently at the moment, mm. Australia at the moment. Mm. Uh, not concurrently, because we haven't started negotiating and we can't until they actually leave. Yes. We were hoping to maybe have been able to start a free trade agreement uh, you know, negotiation about now because we're post uh, the initial date of the 29th of March, but obviously that hasn't happened. So we uh, wait with bated breath for them to finally leave the uh, EU and then we can start that. But yes, you're right, if they do stay in the EU, uh, well, we'd hope that the UK would very smartly get back to the table on the EU side mm. uh, and the discussions and work we've done in terms of Australia and UK would obviously play then into that broader EU-Australia free trade agreement. OK, well, look, I'll talk to you again after Theresa May lobs it back into the European side over the channel. David McCready, thank you so much. Pleasure. Right, here we are. Now, that's all for the show tonight, actually. Thanks for your company.